This meeting is being recorded. Good morning, all. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning uh, here on the East Coast. And for those of you in other parts of the world where it's not morning, uh, good afternoon. Happy to have everyone. Uh, this is a continuation of the Chief Scientists for the Air Force Office of Scientific Research's Distinguished Colloquia series. Uh, we kicked off with a bang here, and this is our third in the series, uh, with the privilege to have uh, Dr. Nandini Iyer from uh, our office uh, in Europe, uh, in Ryslip, uh, join us and to introduce our guest today. Uh, Dr. Iyer comes from the 7-Eleventh Human Performance Wing. She is one of our senior human performance uh, scientists. Uh, we'd love to get her back in the laboratory, but I don't know that that's ever going to happen, but we'll do our very best because she is pretty darn good researcher uh, and in the times that I've, that I've, I've seen her working in the past. Uh, we are also very, very fortunate to have Professor uh, Rosin Owens from uh, Cambridge University, uh, who's a fellow of uh, Newnham Noon, Noon, College, and I'll let Dr. Iris maybe talk a little bit more about that. That is a very unique place to be from. And at this point in time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Iyer. Thank you, Dr. Roach. Uh, good morning, good evening to all of you. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Roshi Nowens to our Air Force R family and introduce her to present her Air Force R funded research to this audience. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, uh, Roshin. Roshin received her undergraduate degree at Trinity College Dublin, and then subsequently her doctoral degree in biochemistry and molecular biology from Southampton University. One of the things I specifically like about her is she is a lifelong student, and you can see that from her career path. Uh, subsequent to her PhD, she completed two, not one, two postdoctoral fellowships at Cornell, one in microbiology and immuno immunology, and the second one in biomedical engineering. And then following that, she spent about eight years in Provence, France, where she was a group leader in the Department of Bioelectronics. As uh, Dr. Rhodes said, she's currently uh, a professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology at Cambridge University, and also a fellow at Newham College in Cambridge. This is one of only three remaining women's college in all of UK, all three being in Cambridge. Um, I think uh, when Roisin first started, she was firmly in the biology uh, field, and she credits her husband with dragging her <laughs> to work at the intersection of bio biology and electronics, which has only enhanced the field. Um, her research interest has kind of uh, moved around from biology to electronics, and she has a special interest in uh, using organic electronic materials for monitoring biolo biological systems, especially in vitro. And this is especially useful um, in our case where uh, through IOE, we funded her to work on monitoring uh, the gut brain microbiome axis. So today I will uh, hand it over to Roisin and let her talk to, her, talk to us about some of the research she's done. Great. Welcome Roisin. Thank you very much. Now, is that correct, Nandini, or is it the wrong way around? It's correct. Okay, wonderful. I got it right. So thank you very much to Dr. Roach and Dr. Iyer. I was really honored that um, they and some other colleagues came to visit us in Cambridge a couple of months back. And I am a proud recipient of, I don't know if you can see my medal, my gold medal. <laughs> so I think I am officially a member of the Air Force uh, Officer Sponsored Research Club. Um, so without further ado, I am going to tell you about some of the work we're doing. I'll give you a bit of a background and then hopefully um, get quickly to the heart of the matter and tell you about the research that has been um, funded uh, under uh, Nandini's great steerage. So um, bioelectronic tools to study the gut brain microbiome access. And let me quickly just tell you about um, generally what we're doing in the group. So we are a very multidisciplinary team. I myself, as Nandini said, started out as a biochemist and then get more and more and more interested into biomedical engineering. And I'm now in a chemical engineering department, having previously worked in electrical engineering. 
So um, we work on biology at different length scales. And the idea is we're, we're trying to increase complexity, not for the sake of it, but because we're trying to mimic um, biological systems in vitro, really trying to be physiologically relevant. And to interact with the biological systems, we're saying, let's make the device fit to the biology and not the other way around. Um, I have worked with many different methods for monitoring biological systems. And when I started understanding about electrical monitoring, and I'll tell you about our specific electrical monitoring systems, it really seemed to me like there was a, a very good fit that the electrical systems for monitoring biology could be dynamic, give you lots of information. They could still allow you to do your optical monitoring because biologists are, are obsessed with having a, a visual image and you could just get a huge amount of information. So we, we work iteratively. We improve the biology, then we adapt the device. Then we go through a second round of that until we hope we're in a situation where we're, we're developing devices specifically to monitor particular things. And I'll give you some uh, examples of that as I go along. So what kinds of devices do we use? Now, I, I really won't talk a whole amount, a whole lot about the devices because I really want to talk more about the applications. But to tell you, we're not using um, your typical types of uh, electrode materials. We're using conducting polymer electrodes. And there are a number of reasons for that. And Nandini mentioned my husband um, introducing me to the field. He was working on organic electronics at the time. Um, most specifically for things like organic light emitting diodes or organic photovoltaics. But it turns out that these materials are actually really, really well suited for monitoring biology. And that's for a number of reasons. So one of the reasons is that you can have a conducting polymer device where the active area is actually open to the, the biological media. So if you have something like cell culture media, you're actually in the solution, you're not encapsulated, which means you can get closer to the biology. And that's sort of illustrated in the top right of the screen here, that you're really measuring ions are going from the uh, cell culture media or the phosphate buffered solution into the material and they're changing the material, they're changing the conductivity of the material. Another really cool thing for me was that these uh, materials come in a liquid formulation, which means you can really think outside the box when it comes to formulating these into different types of devices. Now, initially, we started off, like a lot of people, making planar devices, putting films on top of rigid materials. But you can make these conformable. You can weave them. You can knit them. We made, and you'll see examples of that throughout the talk, three-dimensional scaffolds, because we knew we could then send cells into the heart of that scaffold and we're making a sort of a synthetic biology tissue. So what kinds of things can we measure? I'm going to you know, point you to a number of reviews early in this talk um, if you want to get more information here. But the types of things we can measure is um, essentially if you had uh, an electrically active cell, like a neuron, like a cardiac cell, you can measure action potentials. You can measure that electrical activity. But in fact, all cells have ionic flux and that ionic flux can be converted into an electronic signal. And we work a lot with what we call barrier tissues. So these are tissues which actually restrict the flow of ions between them. And it's very important in biology that you have this kind of compartmentalization. So we can do impedance sensing of so-called barrier tissues. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. We can also do analyte detection because if you have an electroactive material and you have a molecule like a metabolite that interacts, um, you can measure that very nicely. And I won't talk a lot about that at the, uh, in this talk. So we can measure all kinds of things, but what did we think about applying these materials and devices to? Well, I had a, a real interest in studying the microbiome and it was just a, a sort of a personal interest. And of course, we're lucky enough in science that sometimes we have a personal interest and we get to marry that with our professional interest. Um, and when I was looking at the microbiome, how would you know what was going on in the microbiome? How would you know how it affects our health? We, people tell us you have more microbial species in your body than you do your actual you know, human cells. We know that it plays a very important role in our gastrointestinal tract and actually that it can affect our brain health. 
But there are very limited ways to study that. So you could study that in what's called a germ-free mouse, where it's never been exposed to any kind of a pathogen or even to a commensal, any kind of bacteria. Um, and you could do clinical trials, but there's a lot that we need to understand. And so really there's a, a need for in vitro models. So that means being able to you know, model these systems in the lab, in Petri dishes, in um, tissue culture plates. But it's actually pretty difficult because you're talking about two organs and trying to mimic those organs. Now, in terms of the tools we want to use, it seemed to me that bioelectronic tools really could be very well suited, not just because we've got two organs who are being able to measure the barrier integrity is very important in the gastrointestinal tract. Having a healthy gut means having a leak free gut. And as soon as you have sort of leakiness in your tissue, then that can be an indicator of things going wrong. And of course, signaling to the brain changing. So being able to measure the integrity of barrier tissue continuously, dynamically would be hugely beneficial. Uh, you could also measure the enteric nervous system. So we know we have uh, nerve endings in the gut, they signal through the vagus nerve, but we'd need to be able to monitor and think about how that would be connected. Of course, there are all kinds of other types of interplay with immune system, and I'll go into a bit more detail in a moment. And we're also very interested in things like metabolites that would be secreted. So being able to look at gut health, but of course, we can also think about being able to measure brain health. In our case, the bit that we're interested in is blood-brain barrier, because when we think about communication of soluble things that would go between gut and brain, we think they would have to cross the blood-brain barrier. And there's some good literature out there saying that things happening in the gut can have knock-on implications on the gut, and then you might want to model where something crosses the blood-brain barrier and maybe it affects uh, neurons. So we're, we're not looking for much, just the moon. Um, we want to be able to do this in vitro. And the good news is for a researcher is we have plenty of material to work with. So we have a mantra in the, in the lab, we say all models are wrong, but some are useful. We're paraphrasing George Box here. Um, but it's just to say, you'll see that we're developing models and in certain, um, in all of our models, we have specific questions that were asked, but we're always careful to know the limitations of our model. So when you see we're building up the complexity, we always have in our mind, well, there's this thing wrong about the model. Some of our models are reductionist. So I, I, I um, ask your indulgence to just bear in mind, we're building the models, but we're very careful to be sure not to ask too much of our models, especially when it comes to species differences, as you'll see. So in the field of tissue engineering, it's become very clear that the in vitro models that you build up are, um, you know, they've been somewhat lacking in the past because we typically grow cells on flat rigid surfaces uh, in a monolayer. So we're growing the cells in a single layer, but that is nothing like real biology. And it's been over 30 years now that we know that um, really we should be growing cells in three dimensions. And not just in three dimensions, but stratified. There has to be certain cells in the right place. There are different types of biochemical cues and mechanical cues. So that's pretty well accepted now, the biochemical and mechanical cues, that cells respond to that. And if you really wanted to recreate uh, a tissue in the lab, you should be thinking about those cues. Turns out electrical cues are really important as well. We know that cells change their membrane potential uh, depending on whether they're fast growing or slow growing. In fact, that could be the cue that tells them whether to grow fast or slow. On either side of a wound, there's a potential difference. Cancer cells have a very different membrane potential. So this is a kind of a signaling. So what if you could have a material for tissue engineering that would allow you to have biochemical, mechanical, and electrical cues. Now, the reason, of course, we're interested in tissue engineering is we want to have very good in vitro models of our organs. So we need to think like a tissue engineer would. A tissue engineer is going to implant those back in a body. That's you know what the field started out as. But in the in vitro space, there's a huge amount of interest in developing these uh, organs or tissues to be able to test things and monitor things like the microbiome, for example. So to be able to do tissue engineering, to have electroactive cues, to have biochemical cues and mechanical cues, and as I'll show you, to actually be able to do monitoring, we 
decided to take our conducting polymers, but instead of making flat devices, to turn them into three-dimensional devices where we could actually host the cells in an environment that would be good for their development and also take advantage of the fact that these are electrically active materials so we could actually monitor the cells by measuring impedance in, in, in most cases it's a simplified measure of impedance. So one of the first examples was taking P.PSS uh, and freeze drying it. So it's a method called ice templating. You um, pour your P.PSS and a couple of other additives into a mold you put it into a freeze dryer, you control the rates of freezing, and then you get these scaffolds, which are like a sponge that are quite squishy and soft, and they are stable in liquid media, and you can then grow cells inside. Now, the first example, we actually turned this into a transistor because we had a three terminal device, and the scaffold was the channel of the device. So it was a very slow transistor. It will never be found in any Pentium chips. But the nice thing was, was we made it large enough to grow um, inside a tube. We did it in situ so we could make the scaffolds inside the tubes and then we could grow cells inside and then perfuse the cells. And very nicely, we were able to follow the growth of the cells over time, how they attached, how they um, grew and then how they differentiated. And those different phases were associated with different electrical signals. In this case, it was the transconductance of the uh, transistor we were measuring. In a lot of the later examples I'll show you, um, the uh, we're actually using electrodes, not transistors. Now, I don't think this is going to play. I just wanted to show you a micro CT reconstruction of our scaffold showing you that they are highly interconnected. We've got conducting materials. So it means if you attach an electrode on one side and on the other, we have a continuous electronic pathway. And so we're able to measure um, things in our devices. So in this example, um, you can see scanning electron microscopy. We wanted to mimic the gastrointestinal tract um, and so the gastrointestinal tract is like a long tube. So what we did was we took our device, but this time we made a central lumen, like you saw on the micro CT. And you can see that these we place in um, cell culture dishes, so we can then seed cells. And you're seeing here the electrical characterization data from the uh, transistor. So we have both impedance um, just if we operate them as electrodes, and then we have the transistor data. Um, moving on to growing the cells inside, we developed a method where we would seed a particular type of cell in the bulk of the scaffold that would kind of as, act as a glue or a, it's, it's like the, the, these cells produce a huge amount of what we call extracellular matrix, which is a tissue that would underlie um, your uh, cells that would form uh, the lining of your gastrointestinal tract. These are epithelial cells. And then a couple of days later, we add the epithelial cells. And the nice thing here was that the cells auto-organized beautifully. They followed the cues, the mechanical cues. They pointed in towards the lumen. They produce mucus, which is important later on because the bacteria of your microbiome sit in these mucal layers. So this was all very well and good. We could grow the cells. We could form stratified tissues. Um, but could we do impedance monitoring? And the answer is yes. And we could do that over a period of nearly a month where we grow the fibroblasts first, we let those settle into the bulk of the scaffold. Then we see the epithelial cells on top and we see this characteristic differentiation because these are barrier tissue cells. So they grow to fill the space. And then once they form this nice lining, they differentiate, meaning that they polarize, they grow taller, they form lateral junctions between the cells. Um, and that is a highly resistant layer, which will block the ion flow. That means blocking the ions from entering through into the scaffold, which means that we see a decrease in the electrical uh, conductivity of the scaffolds. And that's what we're measuring here in these Bode plots. We see a shift from uh, lower amplitudes to higher amplitudes, meaning we have an increase in the resistance. And of course, the reverse is true. If you add um, a chemical, say, that would reduce that impedance, 
uh, reduce the lateral junctions by dissociating them, then you would see a characteristic decrease in the impedance. So we have the beginnings of a method to be able to host the cell, the cells in the tissue, and to be able to monitor that. Um, for anybody who might be familiar with what's called H&E staining, it's typically used by a pathologist to stain tissues, maybe to look for cancerous or rogue cells in a tissue. We did that to our scaffolds, which were um, seeded with cells at the end of experiment uh, of about a month. And I think this illustrates for me as a biologist that our scaffolds, even though it's a synthetic material, it's quite non-invasive. You can see the scaffold material in black here. Then you can see the fibroblasts have made what we call a connective tissue, and then the epithelial layers on top. And the pathologist thought that this looked quite like a human tissue sample. I should say all the cells up until now have been, um, we're, we're using human cells wherever we can. Another great advantage of working in vitro. Um, so the tubister, that I showed you and the tubular scaffold. Um, they're great. We're trying to mimic the biology. We're trying to mimic the fact that we have a tubular gastrointestinal tract, but they are quite low throughput. And so we had to go back to um, think again about how we could really provide a tool to cell biologists or to people studying the microbiome where we could have something a bit more high throughput. And so we we were inspired by a device that's called a transwell. It's, it's not really a device. It's simply a hanging insert that sits into a traditional biologist's well plate. Now it sits, it's a nylon um, filter. Sometimes it has plastics like PT, which have um, pores of about 0.4 microns in diameter um, studded around um, this nylon filter. And the idea is that you grow cells on top, they sit suspended in media and they receive cues from underneath and cues from the top. And this helps them to be in a more in vivo like environment, more like in the body. And so what we did was we adapted these transwell filters that instead of having this flat nylon track edged filter, we replaced it with one of our scaffolds where we had sliced them. Now we made slices of different thicknesses, it turns out you need more like three to 400 microns to be able to get something thick enough to host a good tissue. Um, you can see that the impedance characterization of the basic scaffolds doesn't show a huge difference. And we're again getting these nice uh, continuously interconnected um, pores of about the right size for growing cells inside. Again, our strategy is similar to what I showed before. We see fibroblasts first, which form this cushioning layer and give something for the other cells to attach onto. And in this case, we decided to expand that a bit. So you see fibroblasts growing very happily in the um, scaffold pores. Then for our gut model, we added two different types of cells that are epithelial. One of the cell types produces mucus. So again, that's going to be important for future applications. So this was a simple model of gastrointestinal tract. And then we also thought it would be nice to show proof of concept for an endothelial cell type. So that would be something like a blood vessel. So we used uh, Huvex for that. And similar strategy, we grew those on top of the um, fibroblasts. So the images all look good. They were expressing the markers that we would expect. And in terms of the electrical monitoring, again, we're doing um, uh, impedance, complex impedance analysis, and these are Bode plots. And what's nice is you start to recognize signatures. So the intestinal epithelial cells form highly resistant very leak proof layers. And so we see this very characteristic bump in the impedance profile here compared to the um, just the fibroblasts alone. In terms of the Huvex cells um, on top of the fibroblasts, we see a slightly shifted profile um, and a less pronounced uh, shift in magnitude. So we're starting to recognize that different cell types, different tissue types give us different signatures. And now actually we've extended this to many more types of cells, including astrocytes, neurons, and um, other types of endothelial cells. And we're starting to see even more patterns. So we're hopeful in the future that you could have multiple different cell types, and you could deconvolute to tell what kinds of cells you had um, present. Um, okay, 
So I told you that we've been developing models to be able to get towards studying the microbiome. And for that, um, one of uh, my postdocs is actually funded through um, the Air Force, um, is working on this model to be able to cultivate both microbes and other cell types that would be important. And this was one of the first examples where she's taken um, one of the models, so with fibroblasts and epithelial cells um, of different types, and she's been adding them. But the difference here now is that we're starting to add um, bacteria. So this is the initial characterization, similar to what I just showed for the electronic transmembrane device. But now in this case, she's adding um, different types of bacteria, which for us are going to be representative of the microbiome. Now, in a lot of cases, people want to keep bacteria as far away from their tissue culture as possible. And I'll go through in a bit more detail in a moment about how we try and keep things separate. But for the purposes of, of this part here with the transmembranes, I wanted to show you that she's now been able to um, distinguish effects from different cohorts of microbes. So initially when we started, we started with E. coli. So you're all familiar probably with E. coli. It's a very standard lab strain, but actually it's a standard um, bacterium that you would find in your gastrointestinal tract, which is non-pathogenic. There are pathogenic forms of E. coli, but this is not one of them. And generally what we see, so this is adding bacteria to um, a culture that's been grown for about a month, which has the fibroblasts and the two types of epithelial cells. We initially see a bit of a dip, but then we see a recovery after about 24 hours. So these are live cells. So there's interactions happening between the different cell types, host and bacteria. Now she has added um, something called the Suhumi model. So Suhumi is a mixture of four um, pro-inflammatory and pro for anti-inflammatory microbes that's thought to be more representative of a more complex microbiome. Now, I'm not going to go into the different types of microbes that are in there, but at the moment, it was easier for us to use um, what we call a postbiotic. So these are not actually alive, they're dead. And what we noticed was that we see this decrease in the barrier integrity, but we don't see any recovery. So what this is leading us to believe, and actually, sorry, I should have mentioned, but we have E. coli um, post, E. coli is one of the bacteria in here. So essentially, we know that the bacteria need to be alive, or we think they do, to be able to recapitulate um, the fact that the microbes should actually be beneficial for your gut uh, integrity. So that's what the literature would lead you to believe. Okay, so that's the transmembrane device. Now, quite often when we're um, developing um, our biological models, we don't use our um, complex, you know, conducting polymer devices. We do things relatively simply using a transwell and using a commercial impedance analyzer. Now, the commercial impedance analyzer is not as sensitive as our devices because they're separated physically. The electrodes are separated physically and we're not getting such intimate contact with the, uh, the cells, but it's still a good place to start when you're developing more complex biology. So in uh, the gastrointestinal tract, we have many, many different cell types. And up until now, I've really been only telling you about some of the cells in the connective tissue and this epithelial layer, some of them, and a couple of representative types of um, bacteria, but it's more complicated. So Anthe, um, when we started on this project, decided to integrate the immune system. And that we think is important because we're pretty sure that there has to be crosstalk between the microbes above the epithelial cells and immune cells below, probably via soluble mediators. So what she did was she made gels out of collagen and she put those on top of a transwell and she seeded um, different types of immune cell, either monocytes or macrophages inside those gels. Now, this is important because the cells then have a three-dimensional um, place to live. 
that is more representative of where they would normally grow. And the immunologists we talked to were hugely surprised that we could get them to last for the three weeks that would be required for the epithelial cells to grow. Normally they just peter out and die after a few uh, days. And interestingly, if we measure transepithelial resistance, which is a parameter that we can extract from the impedance, which is essentially telling you about the integrity of the barrier, we see that when we have macrophages inside the gel and the intestinal epithelial cells on top, we have an enhanced integrity. And it's, it's even less leaky than before. We can, of course, do imaging to check that all the cells are alive, the immune cells are still in the gel, the epithelial cells are on top, expressing all of the right markers. Um, and then we added our E. coli, which at the beginning, you know, as I told you, um, the cell biologists hate if you're coming anywhere near them with bacteria. But the beauty of this system is that we're producing mucus where we have a sort of a... Um, a gap between the, the top of the epithelial cells and where the bacteria are sitting. And this is how it would be in your gastrointestinal tract. And so when we image the E. coli, which are shown here in green, actually there's a bit of a separation between them and the, the epithelial cells. When we add um, the uh, bacteria, which is actually shown on my next slide, this was a control just making sure that the macrophages don't alter things drastically. When we add the bacteria, again, we see what we saw with the transmembrane, that we see an initial dip, these are live E. coli, but then we see a recovery over time. Now, one of the points of this paper was also to look at something called extracellular secretory products from a type of um, a worm, a gastrointestinal um, parasite, which is thought to actually enhance your immunity, to enhance your gastrointestinal um, integrity, if you like, and actually be protective against some inflammatory diseases of the gut. And in fact, when we add this worm juice, yes, they do call it worm juice, to the cultures, we see a slightly accelerated profile. And we were to do cytokine analysis to show that certain um, cytokines were um, expressed less, so these would be pro-inflammatory, so we have less inflammation when we have these ESP products. So this was a nice demonstration, actually, that our model could be used for something that was of use to the biological and, in fact, in this case, veterinary community. So Anthe is always looking for the next great thing, and it wasn't enough for her to put in immune cells. Now she's been looking at putting in neurons. Now, neurons is more difficult because, of course, the neural cultures, you know, where are they going to come from? And it was easier for us to start with a cell line. So this is a neuroblastoma cell line called SHSY5Y. They're thought to fire. Um, some people don't like using them, but they're just a very easy cell type for us to use. And if you use the right protocol of biochemical parameters, you can get them to differentiate into at least neuron-like cells. We were very happy to see, though, when we grew them in a three-dimensional gel-like environment, we saw enhanced differentiation, enhanced extension of neurites. And in fact, now we've done uh, calcium imaging to show that we're definitely getting some spontaneous firing of these cells within gel. So we're very excited about that. It, it would be a method that would be higher throughput. We wouldn't need to extract neurons of the wrong species from rodents to put in our um, 3D cultures. So that's next to be integrated. And in parallel, Anthe has been working on the intestinal, um, sorry, in the epithelial layer to make that even more in vivo-like by using organoids. So these are taken from um, human patients where you isolate stem cells from the crypts, which are these sort of folds in the gastrointestinal tract. You have these um, halfway mature stem cells, which if you grow them as organoids in gels, they produce of their own accord with a few helping hints from um, some biochemical media and mediators, they produce lots of different cell types that we wouldn't have been able to reproduce. We would have had to use 10 separate different cell lines. So Anthe has just figured out how to make these organoids, amplify them, and then overlay them 
on top of our stratified tissues. So again, that's another exciting movement towards getting a more complex in vitro model that will really truly do, um, represent what we see uh, in the human body. What about the brain? So the brain is even more complicated if you would believe it. And in fact, what we're, we're not modeling the brain, we're modeling the neurovascular unit. So if we think about the fact we've got this barrier, which is the blood brain barrier, but in three dimensions, it's quite complicated. So to simplify again, we turn to the trans well, and we've chosen to represent this neurovascular unit with three different cell types. Um, to cut a long story short, because I see I'm, I'm, I'm running long, um, we developed a differentiation protocol when to add each cell type. And we've been doing characterization to look at the trans epithelial resistance using our commercial impedance analyzer. The impedance is much, much lower in the blood brain barrier than you would get uh, in the gastrointestinal tract. That's possibly an artifact of being in vitro. It's thought that in vivo, it's actually very, very high. But at least what we can say for now is that with our triculture system, which has astrocytes, brain capillary endothelial cells, and neurons or neuron-like cells, we're seeing enhanced uh, resistance here. And then the um, permeability to small molecule flux, which should be quite low, is, is at least similar in all of those conditions where we have the capillary endothelial cells. In terms of the scaffolds, we had to adapt the scaffolds. And here I'd like to point out an advantage of these liquid conducting polymer um, formulations we're using is that we can add in different types of materials at the point before freeze drying. And so we had this example where we've mixed in hyaluronic acid, collagen and laminin, all important biomolecules that would be found in the brain compartment. The brain is also quite um, significantly softer, so it's less stiff than other tissues. And so these biomaterials help to reduce the stiffness and make something a bit more, even more jelly-like than what you would find in connective tissue in the rest of the body. And again, an interesting sort of side finding was that neurons or neuron-like cells grown in these conducting polymer scaffold composites tended to show quicker, more quickly, neuron-like phenotypes. They were extending, um, their neurites were longer. We got more expression of the marker. So here we're seeing beta tubulin um, and here we're seeing neurite outgrowth. I would say there's, there's at least some difference between the composite scaffolds and the pristine scaffolds. So another nice example of where you can tailor materials for your application. Um, we, of course, have to check that the impedance monitoring won't be compromised, and there isn't a huge amount of difference depending on whether we have the biopolymer present or not. We uh, worked with a colleague in Reading, Francesco Tamanini, to do patch clamping on the, um, the differentiated uh, cells inside the scaffold. And what we saw with the composite scaffolds was what he described as a more mature neuronal phenotype. So again, evidence that our in vitro modeling can produce something really noteworthy. We're now working on getting the other cell types into our scaffolds. We can recreate the triculture model in a really 3D environment. And so um, we've been growing um, the capillary endothelial cells and they like the scaffolds. These are actually now just PSS scaffolds I can't believe I've gotten to this point in, this, in the talk without mentioning that the conducting polymer we're using is P.PSS. It is, and it's a commercially available material. Um, I can give more details on that later if anybody's interested. Um, so the cells like the scaffold, they line pores, but they also start to fill pores. And something is similar. Uh, we have co-cultures of astrocytes and neurons. We believe that the astrocytes will support the neuronal cultures, and we're looking into evidence that that is true. Okay, so our in vitro models, we're, we're making them more and more complex, but still reductionist enough that they're manageable. But we really still have to think about how they connect to eventually humans. 
And the intermediate step on that pathway is that we have to work in animal models because we need to be able to um, monitor the entire gastrointestinal tract and how that connects to the brain. And ultimately, even though we can do some things in vitro, we will have to do some validation in vivo. I don't have time to talk about it today, but we're actually developing an in vitro rodent model of the gastrointestinal tract. So we'll be able to do comparisons in case we pick up some species difference, um, not an artifact, but something that arises in rodents that then doesn't compute or translate to a human model later on, not a human model, like human clinical trial. So Alex Boys is another postdoc in the group. He has an HFSP fellowship, and he's been focusing on um, gastrointestinal probes using our conducting polymer uh, devices. And he's specifically focused on targeting the submucosal plexus. So not so much the myenteric plexus, but the submucosal plexus, which is the enteric nervous system layer, which would be closest to the mucosa layer, where all of our modeling has been done so far. So this is where all of the epithelial cells and the microbes and so on are. And this is in collaboration with University uh, College Cork and with the bioelectronics lab um, in the Department of Engineering here in Cambridge. So Alex is actually joined between the two labs. And so he's done a great job of learning techniques and technologies developed by George Maliaris and his team for implanted um, in vivo probes. Um, in this particular case, this was inspired actually by a design developed by Nick Maloche at Stanford, where we have this kind of paintbrush idea where you have separately articulated probes that can spread into a tissue. And this is particularly uh, useful in the case of the enteric nervous system, where the neurons are more sparse um, and maybe harder to access. So you want to be able to have a good chance that some of your probes end up uh, close to a neuron. And they're designed in a sort of a tetrode format. So at least four electrodes would be close to each other. And I should say, these are not transistors. These are uh, P.PSS um, electro coated electrodes um, for implantation. Now, actually, in the beginning, we didn't do this in, in live animals. We did it on um, an ex vivo uh, preparation. And this is where we went to Cork to learn how to do this. So what you're seeing, it's a bit complicated, I apologize, is an organ bath. So what we have is they, they can take the whole gastrointestinal tract from the animal and essentially perfuse it. So you, you flush fluid through it through the central lumen of the gastrointestinal tract and around it to keep it alive. And you can work on these tissues and the, the neurons will still fire and your cells will be viable, et cetera. So this was the setup that they had. And you can see here the, the head stage coming down and then the probe is sitting here. Now, in this case, all of the muscularis, all of the muscle layer has been stripped off. And in fact, here on the next image, you can see one of the probes with the separately articulated electrodes just sitting on top. In this case, we're not penetrating into tissue. We were just doing a, a simpler measurement where we would just see what we could measure with these relatively first generation devices. Now, of the various different things tried, um, the, the simplest thing where uh, we see a stimulus followed by an effect is distension. So you push liquid through the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract, which causes it to, to distend. And that's quite a gross signal that the neurons respond to. And in fact, if you look, so this is uh, analysis that's been done by Amparo from the Biotronics Lab. Um, and essentially, she applies a method to be able to figure out what is artifact and what is real signal. Um, and essentially where we see this green clustering is really where the distension has taken place and where we're seeing the response. And you can see the different layers of signal being separated out here. And the, we know when the distension was applied and it corresponds to this layer of signal here shown in green. So that was the ex vivo. 
Um, and some very hot off the press data is recent data that Alex took in vivo. Now here, actually, we had to go back and redesign the probes just to make the, the surgery possible and easier. And so you see, this is a summary slide showing the probes and the very important suture loop to keep the probe in place once you've um, done the surgery. And the surgeries are done with another team member from the bioelectronics lab, Alejandro Carniche Lombardo. So the, the details of the, the surgery are here. Of course, now we can't strip off anything. We actually just have to try and do the surgery to insert the probe in the right place, a bit like landing the Millennium Falcon is what they told me, um, and then putting it in place. And the sort of the initial data we have is shown here. I've put the ex vivo data here just for comparison. Note that the time scales are very different. We would expect that in vivo. And we're still trying to figure out exactly what we're seeing and what is the nature of the signal. But this corresponds to when the distension um, occurred in the in vivo model. So I've shown you a lot of data. It was really just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much data, so much excitement about this project. So many things we want to do. I've got a postdoc working on the metabolomic side, trying to extract samples and be able to analyze what happens. And we're doing a lot more on the ex vivo part, being able to correlate in vitro models with ex vivo and then ultimately in vivo. I am going to stop here by, oops, not there. Apologies for anybody who's squeamish. I didn't mean to go that far. Um, I wanted to stop with the acknowledgement slide um, and just thank the fantastic team of people. Of course, to the funding agency, Fernandini, for, for believing in our project and um, just highlight Sophie doing ex vivo work, Alex, who's here, who did um, the ex vivo and in vivo work, and Anthe, who is around somewhere, who did all of the in vitro modeling. Oh, here she is there. And I'll thank you for listening. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Owens. Um, we do have a couple questions um, for those that are in our audience at the moment, please. Um, Feel free to keep typing in your questions and we will have Dr. Iyer go down um, those that are waiting for questions. Over to you, Dr. Iyer. Hi, um, I'll ask my colleague, Mike Goodson from the 7-Eleventh to unmute and ask his questions. Mike, go ahead. There we go, great. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Well, Russell, thank you so much for this. This is I'm fascinating work. So I have a couple of questions. Um, first off, how long are you able to maintain the bacteria in the transverse system before it sort of starts to overgrow? Is that is that an issue? Um, yes, it is. So for the live bacteria, um, we had to play around with how many, you know, how much to add. And actually, we're working in slightly bacteriostatic condition, conditions. We have a small amount of antibiotic and the FBS is slightly bacteriostatic. Um, this is the case for E. coli. Um, of course, it's no problem for the postbiotic approach. And actually it looks like with the Sahumi model, some of those are anaerobic um, and we think they just won't grow very well. So we're, it's a super good question and it's something we have to figure out um, whether we can go much longer than a couple of days. Okay, great, thank you. Um, can I ask another one? Yeah. <laughs> okay, right, cool. right, and then the, uh, I mean, the, the amazing uh, in vivo stuff that you've, you've just shown us is incredible. Um, could you, I mean, do you envision being able to th flush pretty much anything through that system and then be able to measure, measure charge change, or will it be sort of um, uh, swamped out by the distension uh, charge change? Well, so what I showed you was what worked. <laughs> what was the first thing that worked? So we had tried, um, what did we try? We tried TTX, we tried um, adrenaline, tetrodotoxin, we tried a couple of different things. The problem we're having is knowing what the time lapse should be between the stimulus and the measurement of the effect. 
And also because of the sparsity of the neurons, we're not sure we're always in the right place. So distension worked um, because it's such a big effect. So what we're working on now is more subtle effects, but I would hope in the organ bath that we'd be able to have a pretty good uh, method to be able to flush all kinds of different things through and be able to measure the effect. We have to do some mapping essentially first. Right, yeah, cool. Because, um, you know, because it'd be really cool to be able to see if, uh, you know, nutrients or even, you know, different types of bacteria kick yeah, off. So kick off a, a, a change, a potential change or. Yeah. So essentially nutrients is what we want to go for next. Um, and that works, that ties in quite well with the metabolomics work that we want to do. And, um, you know, microbes would be nice, but we're not working with germ-free mice for this. So we just have to figure out how that would work. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for talking to us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, next is Lexi. Please go ahead. Oh, oh. well, I can Lexi. see the question. So should I just read it and answer it? Yes, please. Go ahead. Uh, so the question is, what are some examples of the signals for the brain that you're hoping to get with these devices? detecting disease, disease progression, general cognitive function or something else. So um, it depends on the model. So in the very simplest scenario, my idea was microbes in the gut co-metabolize something with the host, it, a product, maybe something like a short chain fatty acid goes through the um, gut model, crosses the blood brain barrier, and then we see a difference in firing. That's the simplest thing. It's showing the pathway really for um, that soluble route. In terms of the in vivo, um, you can actually get much more complicated because you don't have to build a model. Um, and there, one of the things we want to look at, and I think we have actually got the first set of data, but I didn't dare show you because it was a screenshot, was to have a cuff electrode on the vagal nerve and then be able to measure the gut at the same time. And so then be looking at that effect. We're not a neuroscience group. So, um, you know, either working with George or other neurologists, we would look at specific um, applications. But for me right now, it's the connection that is very interesting. And specifically in the gut, it would be a question around inflammation. What does inflammation do to how things travel after that? If we are waiting for a uh, for people to ask, may I ask a question, Roshin? <laughs> I know I can access uh, you at any time, but I, I would like to ask a question about how do you envision uh, individual variations being factored into your model? <laughs> well, the honest truth is that the reductionist model means that we're trying to be a, a universal human. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to get something that is a useful model that could answer questions for everybody. But I think in terms of in vitro, the organoid model would allow you to get to a more specific individual um, point. So working with our collaborator, Matthias Zilbauer at the hospital, He's taking, he has a biobank of organoids from individual patients with a known medical history. It's usually IBD. And he actually keeps the microbiome samples as well. So you could even reconstitute that potentially. And there we could say the organoid could be specific to the individual, but the rest of the engineered tissue could be um, this uniform. So then we would at least get the epithelial and maybe even the microbiome com component that would be individual. Um, that's that's what, where we're going at the moment, but of course open to lots of to ideas if other people have ideas. Um, I think there's a hand raised in the panelist group. Dr. Dr. Rich. Rich. 
Yes, there is. So, um, Professor Owens, thank you so very much. Wonderful, wonderful discussion. And, and I did have the privilege of listening to you at, at, at the university, which was a thrill. Uh, but I do have the question of the uh, extrapolation from the animal model to the human model, which seems to be probably, in my mind, one of the most complicated uh, problems that you face in terms of validating the things that you want to say are like human and those things that are not. And the reason I ask that question is because of my background working with non-human primates 30 years ago as a young scientist and trying to extrapolate those differences uh, and including individual variability between species and those kinds of things. And I think it's important to comment to the larger audience if you if you can take the time, you know, your thoughts on, on how you go forward with that with that very difficult but necessary problem over. Yeah, so the first time I really thought about this was at a conference. Um, it's called something like Alternatives to Animal Testing. And, you know, we've been working in vitro models for a very long time. This is our first foray into in vivo because I was so convinced that the in vitro human model could replace a lot and it can replace a lot. And at that conference, there was um, a group of scientists from Roche Predict. So Roche is a big pharmaceutical company. And they were doing in vitro human and in vitro rodent models as a way of doing post-market surveillance. So imagine you've gone through your clinical trial and you start seeing side effects in humans when the numbers go up. And they were using it as a way to try and understand what had happened during their pipeline that had meant that they'd got the wrong answer on something related to toxicity or safety. And that's where I got the idea. Well, if we have an in vitro rodent model and, you know, and some of our, just say we have a benchmark um, assay using LPS and we start to see, oh, rodents, they're super immune. They don't have any kind of a, an effect to LPS, but humans are super sensitive. So that means we're going to have to change something in the model. Can we use maybe a humanized uh, rodent in future or can we somehow emulate the immune system? So at least it would give us some um, you know, to go back to George Box, at, at least tell us, okay, this is a major limitation. We're going to have to be very careful here. So um, it's it's one thing. I, getting from in vivo rat to clinical trial, I mean, there are established protocols for that, but that I think that's what they call the valley of death, where a lot of things go wrong, you know? You know, I, I very much appreciate the, the candidness and, and, and the difficulty of the problem. It's it's but it's but it's heartening to see that you're taking it on. Thank you. We're trying. Uh, so I see another question. Uh, so I'm not sure I understand. This one, so uh, maybe it's related to what I just said. So there's a question about, maybe it's about um, rats and, and humans and passing bacteria between them. Um, what I have learned is that rats have super immune system and um, we will still be vulnerable to things that are pathogenic to rats. So I don't know if that answer answers your question. Um, I have given the permission for the person that submitted the question if they would like to unmute to provide clarity. Sir, go ahead and unmute yourself or ma'am. They seem to be still muted. What we'll do, um, we'll come back. We can move to um, Michael. I sorry, it's me again. Um, but just I'm just fascinated here. So, for your um, for your um, your scaffold model that has the lumen. Um, is it um, is it long enough, I suppose, to be able to like push 
something through the lumen and and be able to measure it measure the charge change or um if or is, is it in is it uh, in a sort of solution completely so that, that the outside and inside aren't sort of separate? So that was the initial idea was that it would be closed so that you would be able to flow something through the lumen and it would go through one end and out the other without somehow making it through the top of the scaffold into the outer tubing. Right. But the issue there is the flow. So what we're still working on with the tubular model is adapting the flow so we don't push off um, the cells because the fibroblasts are not used to seeing flow. So they're actually very sensitive to it. Mm -hmm. So getting a continuous layer of, of um, epithelium into that lumen uh, to allow the flow is actually very difficult. So in the model that I presented, I should have said this, but it was static. So we weren't pushing flow through continuously. Um, the first model without the lumen, we were pushing, but there you didn't have a lumen. So it wasn't as sensitive to the flow rates. So it's something we're still working on, but actually we, we've gotten so excited by the electronic transmembrane because there it's really easy. You just apply a solution on top mm -hmm. and then you wait for it to pass through to the bottom uh, chamber. And there are some really neat solutions to connect wells of a well plate so you can even mimic the flow between different organs. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. I really appreciate it. We are at the end of our time, right, Cindy? Yes, we are. Just want to give an opportunity for the person, um, and, and I apologize, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce your name because I'm going to um, horribly do it injustice. Um, but if you would like to unmute, you can do so to provide clarity. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you should have a microphone. By clicking on that, we'll give you access. I think it's Olorun Toba. Bless you, bless you on that one because I wasn't even going to try. <laughs> I probably got it wrong. <laughs> well, I think at this point um, we can conclude. Um, wanted to thank you, Dr. Owens, for a wonderful talk um, and information that you've provided us. And um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Iyer and Dr. Roach to close out the session. Thank you, uh, Dr. Owens. I would really like to take uh, this time to thank you for taking the time and, and speaking with our group. Um, it's exciting research and I hope uh, to hear more about it when I come around to visit sometime soon, hopefully. We're, we're waiting to over see you whenever you can. Yeah, over to you, Dr. Roach. And Professor Owens and Dr. Arthur, thank you both so much for, for, for going forward. Uh, Professor Owens, we'd love to have you again, maybe in a year or so, and, and catch up with you and see how things are going at that time. But fantastic work, ma'am. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. And I'll go ahead and conclude the session. Have a great day, all. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.